The fate of the Zygon race rests in the hands of the two Doom Boxes. But who will flinch first, human or Zygon? And the ultimate question, which one was Osgood? Get ready for our review today in the Vortex. Broadcast amplitude at maximum capacity. Transmitting through time and space in three, two, one. Welcome to the Vortex. Voices from the Vortex Reviews, Series 9, Episode 8, The Zygon Inversion. Oh, Taylor. <laughs> yes, Matthew. How many Zygons does it take to screw in a light bulb? <laughs> I don't know. How many? What? What are you talking about? There's no Zygons here. <laughs> ah! Oh. And scene. And yeah. <laughs> Voices from the Vortex Theater presents <laughs> horrible jokes. <laughs> Well, so there we go. We got a part two. Yes. The Zygon inversion. Mm -hmm. What do we think? What what do we think inversion? What what did that mean? I kind of, I don't know. The only thing was like the little. Well, if the the clock was inverted on at first (laughs) and Clara's little dream there, but otherwise it was like, what did it mean? Perhaps like the other titles of the other two parters, it's referring to the to the first title part. So, if the Zygon invasion was happening, the inversion would be the opposite of that. The Zygons are fleeing away from invading. Hmm. Just as uh, the witch's familiar referenced the magician's apprentice, which we still don't understand what those meant. (laughs) Uh, Or under the lake referenced before the flood. Or or the other way around. Yep. The girl who... Or the woman who lived referenced to the girl who died. Yes. I see. So perhaps it is an inversion of an invasion. <laughs> who knows? <laughs> who knows? Well, well, Moffat does probably, but um, <laughs> it's, it's not telling. Um... Well, hey, this is Taylor, by the way. <laughs> We're already a couple minutes into this thing. And <laughs> and this is Matt. <laughs> How are we all doing this fine week? Uh, getting ready for another episode of Doctor Who, that's for sure. <laughs> yes. Um, so, I thought, just first reactions, I thought this episode was great. Um, my wish came true. This episode was greater than or equal to uh, the part one. Um, uh, I definitely think it was greater than. Um, I really enjoyed sort of the twists it took and the resolution. And, um, and of course, Capaldi knocked it out of the park again. So I, I just, I, I really liked it. I, it was decent, yeah. Um, I I I don't think it. I don't think it soared above the first part of it. Again, I think all the excitement and intrigue was in the first one, and this one was just the the, the drama and the conversation. Much much like every part two has been this season. Mm-hmm. Uh, I but I enjoyed this one a lot more than the other three part twos that we've been subjected to. I can I can see a parallel where this is probably as good for most people as uh, the witch is familiar was. Um, yeah, been a very little very little actually happens in this episode, mm-hmm. um, and that's except for the revelation of the Osgood box and and obviously the speech and um, uh, just sort of a, a intense look at what is perceived as real and what is real 
Right. No, it was it was decent. Go it ahead. was um I would just say it's it's better than better than I thought it was gonna be, certainly. Um I we, we all know how I've been feeling this season about it, so it, it's it, it didn't it didn't change anything for me. That's for sure. Right. I mean well, I mean, were you disappointed at all with this? Um I don't know. I yes. I don't. I don't think I understand okay. what was really going on. Yeah. There's. It wasn't a Zygon invasion. It was a very, very small group of Zygons turning against their own kind, trying to reveal them to start a war. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't like the Zygons themselves were were attacking the humans. It was a small group of them were attacking themselves, really. Right. Uh, in preparation of a war. Yeah. So I mean, I. I I, I, I can't, you know, okay, that's, yeah, I get the story, but it's not, it, 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 I don't know, it, it didn't, it just didn't impress me at all. Right, um, right, right. I know that speech is sort of the big thing, that, that, that Capaldi speech where he, he talks about what is war and, and, you know, what he's gone through and that why he has the moral authority to, yeah. To, to, to do what he does, which is create a trap, which wasn't even a trap. It wasn't it wasn't real. It was all perceived. He yeah. Was sleight of hand on his part to, to get <laughs> people into the right positions. Yeah. So he could lecture them. Mm-hmm. That's maybe that's what it was. I it, it was the whole the whole plan. Everything he did, all the people that died because of it was so he could get two people in a room and lecture them. Right. And as we found out at the end of that speech, he had done it a couple of times. <laughs> yeah, and I think uh, I think it's funny because in the, for, in the first part he kept telling the general like, just let me talk to them. <laughs> like, just let me talk to some people. You know, no more fighting, no more like yeah. sending people in. Just let me talk to somebody. And it turns out that's really, really is all he needed <laughs> was to talk. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was good. Yeah. Um, what did you think of the, the sort of the dream state that Clara was in uh, and with Bonnie and all that, that conversation there? I thought that was kind of neat. It, it was a neat parallel between the two. I, I feel like they're overdoing the dream stuff with Clara. <laughs> this you know? Is, yeah. Um, from her very first appearance in Asylum of the Daleks... Uh, to even leading all the way up to and in um, time of the um, name of the doctor mm-hmm. with her inside his his time stream, the dreaming that they all had to get into, you know, in order to, to communicate. Um, then of course, you know, the dream from the dream crabs in the in the last Christmas, right? And now this, I, it, it, I, it was a it was a good way to go about it. Yeah. Um, well, maybe it's like, uh, it's, I, it's like, you know, how Amy was like, it was the waiting with her. It was like the girl who waited mm-hmm. and there were several like things where she waited for something. Um, and then this, this is that the, one time like, at Starbucks was, like, <laughs> and this the is TV like, content. this is Clara's thing. It's like, it's a dream thing. And maybe it'll be like something at the end. Some, so maybe somehow she leads the show, something about a dream or something, you know, Right, uh, the girl who dreamed it. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and we are coming up oh. on an episode next called "Sleep No More," uh, where the people don't sleep. You know, so maybe there's something there. Who knows? Mm-hmm. I really. So she's l- going to be very ineffectual in that particular episode <laughs> because she cannot dream her way through it. That's right. No, I, I. It was. It was a neat way to get the two characters to talk, but they. Well, I really enjoyed like you the, know, we, the whole like how she was controlling her like through the TV, and then right, you know, like I thought that was a really neat thing because I had thought, oh, Claire's going to be useless for this two-parter. You know, she's going to be asleep, and then they're going to rescue her. You know, which happens, but I was like, that's disappointing. But then they did they brought this out, and she had a more integral part, which was good. Did, did it feel a little to you like the child in the library from Silence in the Library? Yeah, that. Yeah, I could see that. Now that you say that, yeah. 
That, that was my first one. When, when the whole thing was going down, that's that's really what I was I was thinking was, you know, oh, we, you know, this is like Silence in the Library. Which yeah, is a really great episode. And then I stopped and I thought about it and I went, which was also written by Stephen Moffat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Damn <Well>, it, Moffat. <laughs> it's funny too when Clara like first came. There was all these like theories that Cal was like a young Clara or something. You remember that? <laughs> Yeah, vaguely, yeah. Yeah, it was like all these people kept saying, like, it was one of the theories that was out there for a while. Which was mm-hmm. not true, but, you know. <laughs> right. This doesn't, well, it could still this, be true. This doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It's, um, no, it was, it, was a, it was a unique way to do that. Uh, again, we, we saw that with Matt Smith when it was Smith on Smith mm-hmm. in the uh, Nightmare in Silver. Yep. Um. Even even as far as controlling the uh, controlling the person who was in charge as well. Yeah. Well, and this was a good. I, this, I really liked this the, the, their dialogue together. I think Jenna Coleman did a fantastic job right. with that. Never once did I think like, oh, it's the same person. Like I, I knew that they were. Right. But I was taken out of it so much because she did such a good job with it that I I saw them as two different people. That was great. Oh yeah, absolutely. Jenna Coleman just nailed that that, that dialogue. Um, she I, I nails this episode because you, you know, it's Bonnie the whole episode, and you know, even when Clara's in the room, she's standing off to the side, mm-hmm. and <clears throat> at no point in time did I feel like, you know, I didn't feel like, you know, oh, I'm watching Clara do this. Yeah, like it was Bonnie doing it. Which oh yeah, was great. yeah, You know, I yeah. felt it was definitely someone else. Um, you know, it was she. Did exactly what um, exactly what Troughton did in Enemy of the World. And yes, she pulled it off <laughs> gloriously. Not not quite an, such an accent as Troughton had to put well, on. Nothing nothing beats that accent. <laughs> Medi- Mediterranean <accent? laughs> some no, kind of yes, no. some kind of uh, some kind of Latin, Eastern European. Yeah, who knows? The yeah. Spanish? Yeah, <laughs> who knows what he was? Yeah. Turns out he's like he's from he's from like Burbank, California. <laughs> yeah, it's not it's, it's not even an accent. No, he just he's. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that's just how they talk. That's just how he did it. <laughs> he's from Ontario. <laughs> um, and so they had this really cool scene with with uh where, with the connected pulses. So that I thought that was a neat idea too. Um, oh, to tell if the other one's lying. To tell if the sure. other one was lying, I thought that was pretty neat. Um, you know, because. Again, I thought, oh, well, she's going to be um, just in the pod for the whole episode. <laughs> but the fact that she had such a... That they were still connected like that, and that Clara was still sort of conscious and throughout this whole thing was pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, they, they definitely took it in a different direction than we thought it was going to go. Mm-hmm. I'm not... Um... I don't know. I didn't, uh... I wasn't... Overly... Like... I wasn't underwhelmed by it. But I wasn't overly, like, surprised or... Or... or shocked by... How it ended, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, I, I, I definitely didn't guess that... Bonnie would become another Osgood. That's for sure. Oh, right, right. Which, Is that's... This season... We, well, yeah. I was just gonna say that's interesting that that she did because there's always there's this whole question the whole time and it's like, are you the Zygon or the human? And she's not answering and she's not answering, and I I guess I'm I'm just assuming, but now since Bonnie is like the new second Osgood, I'm going to assume that the first Osgood was human the whole time, because now that you've got two Osgoods. Wasn't the whole point of having two Osgoods so that one of them was human and one of them was Zygon, and you never know which was right. which? So, to, unless it was a lie. Well, that's true. I mean, but to, they could see, it does. It doesn't matter. People are going to assume one is human and one is Zygon. Yeah. It just would seem they, strange. They should really get like five other ones. To, like, <laughs> to be five Osgoods. It's like a whole like cabinet of. 
of Osgood. There would be there would be seventeen Osgood boxes. It's like twelve. It's one watched over by an Osgood. It's like they're a jury, so it's like twelve angry Osgoods, and it's like a whole group of. Oh them. my god! <laughs> Best movie idea ever. And they're they're all there's there's twelve of them, so they're all wearing like different doctor outfits, so you know like they look different. Ah. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> Photoshop, somebody. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that's as that's as great of a movie idea as that remake of Star Wars. I want to do with an all Gungan cast. <laughs> <laughs> me's, me's a use a father. We's a bomb bad Jedi. Me's a say no. <laughs> me's a never Jesus. join you, sir. <laughs> 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 oh, that would be great. If Yusa knows to join me, Yusa be crushing and dying. <laughs> Electricity. <laughs> so maybe, <laughs> maybe you caught on to this more. But I, yeah. there, there were a few. In my opinion, these are dropped plot lines. Like these are things that just got dropped, and I, I didn't understand why they were happening, and then they never answered them. So the first one is there was this guy who Bonnie had made him, like, lose his ability to hide as a human. And so he, like, was changing into a Zygon, and I didn't quite understand, like, like what was the point of that? Why did she make that guy do that? Uh, I, I mean, it was... Oh, no, she because she recorded a video and put it online. Right. So that way people would start... Fe- Fearing that there was an invasion of, of aliens. Yeah, but that that you're right. That plot line really just gets, gets dropped because then they had the conversation for 35 minutes. Yeah. Well, and, and then and then I just don't understand. Like there was a whole there was this weird thing where like the people weren't reacting to anything. Like the guy came out and he turned all Zygon and like the the, the teenagers or whatever he was sitting in front of, they just sat there. And they didn't do anything. Yeah. And then later, when the doctor and Osgood come, like, they just got off the plane crash, and they, there's those police officers, and he's trying to talk to them, and they're just staring at him. Because they were Zygons. Right. But, like, why didn't they... Why were they just staring? I don't understand. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> like, what was that... I... Like, that whole square where that guy changed into a Zygon, were those just all... Was it like a community of Zygon people? Because no one... Rea- that's, that's what I thought. No one reacted to it. Okay, I just didn't understand like why nobody was reacting to anything. I assumed maybe they were Zygons, but then they didn't... You'd imagine, you'd they, imagine though, they'd still react to it. They, they'd well, still yeah. see... They just, yeah, it was like they were frozen. And then the police officers, it's like they didn't say anything to the doctor. They just like stared at him. I don't know. It just seemed like... There was going well, to be. Well, then they some... got out and they started like wi- walking and following him. Right. And I, it, it it seemed like what they were trying to say is the doctor was trying to blend in and maybe maybe they weren't sure, you know, who this guy was. But right. it was clear throughout the first episode that the Zygons know who the doctor is, mm-hmm. and so does Unit. Yeah. And I would imagine so do the police. Like, yeah. I, I can't imagine that he isn't the most notorious character now after nine seasons of New Who. And we've seen, <laughs> we've seen the Earth react by understanding. Every nation on Earth gave him power so he could become the president. And they knew exactly who he was. Yeah. They, yeah. they gave him all their militaries, all their police, all their everything. So, I mean, come on. Like, you know, these. how do these Zygons not know that this is the Doctor? Well, and that's great that it was like a, um, like if that's what they were going for, then that's great. But I just don't feel like they they didn't explain it at all. It was, I thought it was going to be something, like it was something interesting about how these people weren't reacting, but the Doctor didn't like mention it at all. It was like, these people seem to be frozen or something, you know, like it was just like, yeah. It was just in the episode. So I feel like it was like a dropped thing. Because, sure. well, and I, the speech was so good. Like, don't get me wrong. I really love the speech. But it was long. So I feel like maybe they got to a point where they were like, well, we can't cut this stuff out of the speech. Let's cut, like, the explanation of, like, the people <laughs> out of the episode. Like, that's what it felt like. Um, right. You know, that those little parts of that, that you know, that one Zygon guy and then... The, the people not reacting kind of thing. I feel like those just got cut out so that we could have this great speech, which 
was kind of a poor choice in my opinion. I don't know. If you if you said something, no, I I, I agree with you. Yeah, absolutely. It you was. set something um, up. You should answer it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's this. Uh, 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 not not to rant, but in, in this season, this seems to be the biggest problem. Is that with these two parters, all these dangling plot threads are just not being addressed. They're trying to write these big epic stories, but they're not. They're they're completely sweeping explanations under the rug, as if it doesn't it doesn't matter. I mean, who cares how Scarrow came back and all the Daleks exist at the same time and Davros is alive? We get this really great speech for them in the second episode. Yeah, you know. And what does it what does it matter that the Doctor was there twice uh, and nobody really understands why he had to create? A hologram of a ghost. Couldn't he just talk to himself through the hologram? He had a really great speech in the second episode. <laughs> yeah. And what does it matter that after she died and came back to life, that really we're not treated to all the miraculous, wonderful things that she wrote about in her diaries? Instead, you know, we have to watch her pretend to be a bad guy because she's so jaded about about her life. But that's okay. The big cat thing. Capaldi gets a really great speech with her in the second episode. <laughs> yeah. But Osgood's back, regardless of the fact that nobody wants to explain exactly which Osgood she is, <laughs> why it matters. But it's okay, because this is a really great speech Yeah. in the second episode. Um, yeah. But even with, <laughs> <laughs> even with those plot lines dropped, like that did, those did not bug me as much as these two things that I'm going to <laughs> rant about for a second. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. The first... When when K- it's revealed that Kate is actually Kate Stewart and it's not a Zagon, they're like, "How is it you?" And she's like, and then it like cuts to her shooting the gun, and then it cuts back to her, and she's like, five rounds rapid." Now I understand that that's a reference to the the brigadier, and that's great and everything, but why do they have to show her shooting? Like it was just so dumb. Like, I for some reason that really annoyed me that they cut to her shooting. Like, did we really need to see it? You could have just headers go five rounds rapid right. like that would have been it that would have been cool i don't know why but that really bugged me <laughs> it's, it's can, just... I, can i also point out with that that the the cliffhanger for that in the episode beforehand showed like the camera was on the zygon and you heard the shots going off and the zygon stood there totally unfazed so just because you showed us her pulling the trigger and shooting in the gun we already saw that the reaction on the zygon was it didn't seem to matter so that's not an explanation as how she got out of there. A better explanation would be if we saw her standing with the smoking gun over the dead Zygon body. Yeah. Like, that's <laughs> a better explanation, ladies and germs. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I don't know why, but that just the... Sh- just, it's a really petty thing. That it, just for some reason it bugged me that they showed the shooting. Like, yeah. I, it just didn't... I don't know. It was just bad television? I don't know why. It just didn't... It seemed really cheesy. Uh, and my other grievance of this episode. So Bonnie brings <laughs> brings Clara's pod to the Black Archives, and they go through the door into the Black Archives. Uh, but we don't see it happen. But there is no way that that pod fit through the door. But yet it was inside the Black Archives <laughs> in the next scene. How did it get through the door? That just <laughs> how? <laughs> yeah. There's no no explanation. Maybe maybe the pod is a Zygon as well. <laughs> and with Clara in sight of its mouth, it turns into a dog and walks through the door. <laughs> All right, I'll take it. <laughs> how how is it that this how is it this black archive, this vault, which is TARDIS proof, mind you, so the doctor can't get in, how is it that somehow it manages to get broken into by Zygons twice? <laughs> They need to quit. They need. They wouldn't, give. Wouldn't. Why does Clara have clearance to this to this place? Well, that's, that's a good point too. That's the question. But yeah. But let me let me let me let me just a couple things on this. Um, wouldn't you want to put all of the Doctor's great weapons that he's used over the years, all these artifacts? Wouldn't you want to put those in a place that nobody could break into? Not just 
keeping the Doctor away, but Zygon, Cybermen, Daleks, <laughs> the Master, the Mistress, yeah. uh, the Ranny, uh, I, I, Mel, I don't know. Just any number of people that you would not want to see in that room. Wouldn't you want to make it everything proof? Well, and why right? would you why would you put everything in one place? Like, I feel like you want to spread some of that stuff out. <laughs> right. So there's there's another thing. Uh, why why would you put all those artifacts in the same place? Why do you put them on display like that, as if people could walk around and see them, and better understand what they do? Like the board like, with all the companions linked together somehow. Yeah. Like, it's why a, would that board even be there? Like, it's an evidence room, like at a police station. <laughs> Right, it's just right. on a metal shelf. <laughs> exactly. Also, we're going to fast forward to another point here. Why was no one paying attention to that room? Wasn't there like a guard outside the door the last time they went there? Weren't there like <laughs> video cameras watching them? Isn't that unit's greatest secret? Why aren't there 30 or 40 guards on red alert ready to run in there shoot and murder people for going into that room? <laughs> because there's, you know, there's Zygons. Is walking in there. <laughs> Well, but and they're carrying a pod with another Clara inside. Clearly, you can see Clara's face inside the pod, and then there's <laughs> alternate Clara standing there, walking around all, I'll just go into the Black Archive. Mm, yes, indeed. Clara is not a member of Unit. Why would anyone give her that grant, that uh, that clearance without someone like Kate Stewart being there, or you know Osgood being there, or some higher level unit personnel where was ev- where was everybody <laughs> the Zygons couldn't have taken everyone over because if they did then why did they need this contrived plot to turn all the Zygons into Zygons why would they, if they controlled unit why not just take over the world <laughs> this you, is true. Uh, you own an army yeah <laughs> I grr <laughs> and furthermore arg yeah and harumph <laughs> So and harum, <laughs> harum for the governor. <laughs> so yeah, I mean those—they're <laughs> petty annoyances, but for some reason I just—I I, had I had to say something. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and now Matt and Taylor perform Blazing Saddles. Um, <laughs> forget the rest of the, <laughs> the review. <laughs> uh, but uh, I. There's a couple of other really cool things in the episode, though, that do that do make it pretty big. And, and the big thing, of course, was the speech. Yes, that's a huge. That's a huge. That's that, that's the centerpiece of both episodes. Was just that speech the doctor gives. Yeah. Now, why was that speech so important, and why was it so good? Right. Well, here's why. <laughs> it's and, so and important because well, it is. Yeah. Go ahead. And before you begin, don't get us wrong. Like, yeah. well, at least don't get me wrong. I don't know how you feel about this. Like, the as much as I've complained about this episode so far, I really love this. This speech made this episode worth it for me. Like, this speech was one of the most amazing things I'd seen in Doctor Who. Yeah. If, in a, in, you know, I mean, they, there wasn't really anything like this in Series 8. Um, there was stuff like this, you know, in, in the 50th, in, in Series 7 and 6 and all that stuff. And then... Eight, there was really like a moment like this and this was that just killer moment for this series so far so go well, ahead and that's and no that's and that's why it's so important is this was the 12th doctor's defining moment this is the first real time that any of us could see that this is the same character this is the same person as Tennant, as smith as eccleson as all of them mm-hmm. um Everything before this, Capaldi was playing the Doctor. But during this speech, he becomes the Doctor. That reality of who the Doctor is. And he doesn't just live that long. He's done horrible things. Yeah. And he has learned from those experiences and how to change the minds of others. Um, so it is it is a defining moment. Uh, it's, it's good because Capaldi is good. Because Capaldi can deliver that speech with with a sense of realism, with a sense of gravitas and drama, and at the same time make it funny, make it uh, uh, self-deprecating. Mm-hmm. Um, him switching over to the American game show host, as if to say, this is all theater, this is this is the cheese, this is because, <laughs> you know, I have to grab your attention long enough to get to the point. But then from that, he gets so serious, and he, he finds that 
that balance where he can again lecture but he can lecture these two characters about why it's right to stop fighting yeah. why it's important to, to come to an agreement uh, that's that's something we have not seen from Capaldi yet so this was new mm-hmm. this was important well and I feel like this was one of the best sort of post time war um um post time war like explanations you know what i mean of like why like if like i could see um eccleson giving this speech like about why he he is the way he is you know what i mean yeah. Like, because all the stuff he talked about when he goes, he talks about the time war. He goes, I, I did this and I did that, and this, and you know, and so I, I act this way so this, so that I make sure no one else has to do this and things like that. Like, I really loved all of that part of the speech because it, re- it really made like the, um, it put that sort of that time war in perspective. That even though it was so long ago for him, um that this is it sort of turned him into uh something kind of different than he was in classic who because in classic who he was still the doctor and he still did what was right for certain for different reasons and he wanted to and it was more about just exploring and having fun for a while but then after the time war there's this now he's got this moral obligation he's got this this um this thought process that comes from war a purpose yes that he that he explains in this speech so eloquently I now I will be I'll be the first one to say this the speech is good it's definitely the highlight of these two episodes it wasn't the best speech that's been written for New Who not not by a long shot Mm -hmm. the best speeches were given to Matt Smith and if anyone doesn't believe me, go back and rewatch his stuff. Because he does nothing but monologue. And I love it. Every speech he gives is powerful. And he talks about being a Time Lord and being the last of his kind and having lost his his people in a way that even Tenet couldn't articulate. So um, his speech was good. It, it's Capaldi's defining moment. But, you know, it should have been there in Season 8. I think that's something season eight really lacked mm-hmm. we needed this the best we got was his banishment of the boneless is sort of a definition of who the doctor is well um, yeah and i think at the end of, of the end of the series uh, the yeah, whole like i'm just an idiot in a box you happen, know yeah. yeah i'm not a, yeah yeah because it's it's it is it is a moment that he's come to certainly so i i i applaud them for the for the speech certainly um i will Contain my disgust for some of the fan sites <laughs> for having spoiled the speech for me. Yes, <laughs> the episode had literally finished airing in, in in England within minutes. Titles, headlines to stories were coming out saying how that was the best speech ever written for Doctor Who, or you know that that scene, that speech, Capaldi goes all the way and stuff like this. And, so now I'm waiting for it. Yeah, you know? I don't... Now yeah. I'm expecting it. Yeah. Or my my least favorite thing was one of the titles that said, uh, uh, you know, spoiler-free review of episode, and the picture was of both the Osgoods at the end. <laughs> really? <laughs> really? Oh, that's spoiler awful. Spoiler-free review. Yeah. And that was, that was the radio... T- that was Radio Times. And that really pissed me off. Yeah, that's what 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 the hell, guys? <laughs> let, I, it had been minutes since it aired in England. It hadn't even aired in America yet. Let alone the fact that most people probably aren't going to watch it the night that it airs. They're going to watch it the next day on Hulu or on their DVR. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. give people a forty-eight hour window <laughs> to enjoy something before you spoil it. Yeah, give it a week. Yeah, I never. Yeah, I never liked that stuff where it's even if they don't really spoil it, but they like say like. Oh, that scene was like, you know, if, if it's something had said, oh, it's Capaldi's defining moment. Well, that's great and all, yeah. but, th- but now my expectations have been set to a certain level, 
and then right I, like that's why like with the star wars movie coming out i've never like i haven't really looked at anything because i just i want to go into it blind right. like i just want to go in watch the movie knowing what i know about star wars <laughs> and that's it right <laughs> yeah so oh oh so i probably shouldn't tell you that in the movie luke skywalker is luke skywalker's father oh god no. <laughs> Like it, he's his own grandpa. It's like that. It's it's that. Loop. Since it's since it's Disney, uh, <laughs> Kylo Ren turns out to be Kermit the Frog. Oh, I knew it. <laughs> Heidi ho there, time <laughs> to murder some Jedi. His, his lightsaber turns green. Like anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, the speech. I really <laughs> one one part of the speech I really enjoyed was uh, when he talked about how the boxes. It was a scale model of war. Yeah, and the whole idea of the the whole line about even when you no matter how right you feel, even when you make that first shot, you don't know you know who's going to suffer, you know what's going to happen. Um, I thought that was a really neat sort of idea yeah. that, uh, and and I feel like you know how this episode uh, this episode was written by Peter Har- Peter Harness and Moffat, so right it was the two of them. I really feel like it was just like Peter Harness wrote all like the Zygon stuff, and then this speech was written by Moffat. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, like, it was very possible. Yeah, and like that's why it said that. So that was pretty cool. I think, I think this is some of Moffat's good stuff. Like that's some of the that's the thing with Moffat too is like when it's bad, you're, we're like, what are you doing? And you know, it, when it's bad, you'll. You've you've heard us rant about when it's bad, but when it's good, it's it, it's so good, and I feel like this was some of his best stuff. Like, definitely, yeah. Um, and and another cool thing about this speech that I really loved is then he started talking about the time war, and you know me, I love continuity, and this when he started talking about the time war, I I loved it because it to me. Not only did it come full circle with the sort of the Zygon story in the 50th, but also during the 50th, um, you also had the Time War was a part of the storyline. So you had, you know, John Hurt's war doctor in there, and he was going to push a button. And so and when Capaldi says that to Bonnie, you know, like, you know, I had a box and I was going to push a button and wipe out all of my kind. I just, I loved that this speech came with this Zygon story. It was so cool because you had the full circle with the Zygon invasion that happened in the 50th, but also with the Time War, you know, yeah. and the War Doctor thing that was happening in the 50th anniversary as well. So I just thought that was so cool how they did that. Yeah, well, and that's, that's you know, that's I, I think that was sort of an expectation of mine, at least, that, um, you know, we were coming up on this this episode which was going to literally be the continuation of, of a part of the 50th storyline so you, you kind of expected that they were going to discuss it you kind of expected someone was going to bring up by the way weren't you doing something else what was that what was going on there <laughs> so yeah uh, but yeah it's really cool that it came full circle yeah well I, I like that too I think there was even a line maybe like you know you set this up he's like well I was busy I <laughs> had something else going on at the time yeah yeah so that's kind of funny um so I one thing that was cool, uh just a fun little thing, is uh we saw this Hartnell photo in the first part, and then we right. come come back to this episode and there's like a safe hidden behind it. Which <laughs> was so good. That <laughs> was great. So what was important. Yeah. Yeah. It only That's would have been awesome. better if it was like something where the doctor was sneaking behind a wall and then he like peeked through these eye holes and it was the first doctor. A portrait <laughs> with Capaldi's eyebrows. With Capaldi's eyes, I yes, the eyebrows can't contain, can't be contained. <laughs> yeah, I like I like little Easter eggs like that. I think uh-huh. that's fun. Um, I uh, can we? I just one last thing. Honestly, no, I can't do the hybrid talk anymore. <laughs> this. 
I, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I've reached my level of can't even with, uh, it's a hybrid, and then it turns over to Capaldi, who, like, glares at the camera because he's basically just a bird of prey. Uh, <laughs> I don't... <laughs> I ch- Inside I jokes. Do not, uh, I do not want to hear the word hybrid ever again. Look, I, I get it. You know, that's it's a theme for the season. Sure, mm-hmm. it's going to fit into the end somehow. But if he really was involved, or if that was a the, uh, uh, you know, a, a prophecy or whatever, we, that, that would have been around the whole show. I mean, this is this is an this is a perfect example of the writers needed to write something new, so they BS'd something in the beginning of the season <laughs> from an old enemy to make it seem like it had some sort of credibility. Yeah. And now every episode they have to point it out, like, oh, but look over there, a squirrel and a raccoon have made a baby. It's a hybrid. Right. And you're just like, oh, oh my, that could be why the doctor ran away from Rassilon, or from uh, Gallifrey. Yeah. So I, I, I just, I can't do it. I, I don't care. I, well, we, ma- what, we've got two <laughs> more episodes, and then we get the two-parter finale. So we're, yeah. we're going to find out eventually. I just, I'm tired of hearing it. Like, it, it's not subtle yeah. at all. Well, and you know, it's funny. I, I didn't even think there was a reference to it in this episode. But yes, I... I I, yes, I, I agree totally. And I just kind of realized this. Moffat does that where he'll take, he'll have something that you're like, well, why hasn't the doctor heard of this before? So right. uh, the biggest one I can think of is in, is the first question, the question that, yep. you know, it's, is Doctor Who? And you're like, how has he never heard this before? Like, if this question is like the first question the oldest question in the universe. How has he never heard this right. before? And he's just now hearing about it. <laughs> well, and that suddenly there's a prophecy about Trenzalore. <laughs> yeah. And like, if you were like, when did he first, you know, hear? he tells everyone, Oh, I've heard the prophecy. Of course, dozens of times, you know, and I'm like, when, <laughs> when did you hear this? Pro- pro- did, did it literally take you your entire life to basically the episodes before you were going to end up? At Trenzalore to hear about the fact that you were going to Trenzalore? No, you would have heard this, you know, back when you were Baker or Davidson or even Trouton. Like, what? So why didn't you go? Like, what? What's stopping you? You know, <laughs> especially after the Time War, wouldn't you be like, oh yeah, prophecy of my doom, Trenzalore. Should check that out. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, it's, I, I don't understand why he wouldn't go, but yeah. So yeah, so uh, th- that's the thing with the hybrid. That's same thing. So no more. <laughs> if it happens next week, I will pitch a fit. Not <laughs> on the podcast. I'll do yeah. it in private. But yeah. Um. Oh, so- I, I I hope they make they make a reference. Oh God, <laughs> it'll be like it's all found footage, and they're like. The, the doctor will be like, so you, you've got a camera there on your head. I see that you're recording everything. Oh, that's that's good. And they're like, oh, yeah, all of us are recording stuff. We we like to splice it all together at the end of a mission. And he goes, oh, like a hybrid. <laughs> and then they're like, they're like, yes. And then and then he looks at the camera and he goes, bird of prey. So, <laughs> um. Or like, uh like two of the crew members are like eating some snacks and they bump into each other and one of them's like hey you got chocolate in my peanut butter and the other one's like hey you got peanut butter in my chocolate and then the doctor's like like a hybrid <laughs> like a hybrid <laughs> <laughs> hey uh, uh capaldi we see you bought a brand new car what car did you get a hybrid a hybrid <laughs> it's gas and electric Yes, and electric. It's it's Time Lord and Dalek. <laughs> All right. I, now I just pictured a car That's, with like bumps on it, and then like a plunger right. stick and a whisk sticking out the front. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of headlights. Yes. Instead of headlights. Uh, so I had some quotes I really liked in this episode. Um, <laughs> just like the corniest joke, first of all, is. Uh, that's why they're called planets to remind you to planet <laughs> I don't know why but like it was the corniest joke but I just I loved how the like he seems to be doing that lately he's like real delighted in how stupid his jokes are <laughs> right yeah and it delights me <laughs> um, 
I, I really liked when she said, uh, I don't think I've ever seen you smile. And he was grinning. <laughs> and um, I thought about it, and I'm like, I don't think I've ever seen Capaldi smile either, actually. Yeah. In Doctor Who. I don't, I don't, I don't think he knows how. It was a little creepy. So was, <laughs> it was very, not a little, it was very creepy. Yeah. <laughs> um, I liked, um, oh, the line at the end was... was just very ominous and very pretty cool it was just the way he said it and everything where you know Clara's like oh I've been missing I was or I, you thought I was dead for like what five minutes or something he said oh, yeah it was the longest month of my life or something like that or so he said something and like that and she said oh, it, was, oh it could have only been but what five minutes he said I'll be the judge of time <laughs> and just like it, it could have been a joke but like and it, and it is a little funny but at the same time, that's not how they played it at all. It was just like, right? I'll be the judge of time. And it was just like, well, and oh, okay. If she then. was really gone for months. What was going on? Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Who knows? Like, I just, yeah. Um, well, I took it to mean, you know, that it felt like months to him or something. Right. And she just like right. played, and she played it off, sort of, you know, because she's she's being like that now, or she's just like she's the doctor, and she doesn't. See, again, my sort of theory that she doesn't seem to care about dying or anything like that. You know, she just wants to go out there and have these adventures, and she's got nothing else really to, to live for, you know. She just wants to go out there full force. And she's like, oh, what? Well, it couldn't have been, what, five minutes or whatever? And But he's like, no, I'll be the judge of, you know, how long it felt to me, and stuff like that. So, that was a, that was a good line. Uh, I did like his... Um don't look at the browsing history. <laughs> and Hosgood goes, ah, <laughs> I told you not to look. Yeah. Uh, which, of course, you know, I, I doubt very much that was what she was doing. She puts the she puts the glasses on and they automatically went or whatever, you know. And uh-huh. so she was probably just getting acclimated to him. And, and she goes, ah, and then he just keeps he keeps going with the joke, <laughs> which is very funny. Well, see, that's the question, though. What is the doctor Googling? <laughs> Yeah. He, he knows almost everything. What is he googling? <laughs> what? She's she can't understand why he's like learning the lyrics to all the th- the songs from Aladdin. <laughs> like, why is this up? Is a musical episode coming? <laughs> Maybe <laughs> one of these days. He he can play the guitar. <laughs> <laughs> um, and one of the. What my favorite line from the speech uh, is, he says, you know, I do this so no one else will have to live like this. No one else will have to feel this pain. Not on my watch. And I just, I, I loved that because again, it was just a, it was such a great post-time war mentality um, speech, like a, a line that sort of gives us how how the time war has affected him. I mean, I know we've we've gotten a lot of speeches about how the time war has affected him, but this one really felt just felt really strong to me. Uh, and that line really made me like kind of just kind of you know take notice and like oh you know I, that's you know right I like that you know it kind of it made it gave me some feels you know so <laughs> yeah, that that speech really gave me a lot of feels which was nice. Yeah, and it was really nice to see the Doctor in his element, mm-hmm. and not just Capaldi playing the Doctor. Yeah, it was different. Which he does, he does, good. yeah, which he does well. But this was, this was different. This was. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, just we we can't ignore totally and radically driving in space. <laughs> we just. I like to think that he just forgot what it really means. <laughs> yeah, what did my granddaughter? say oh damn it what it was it <laughs> ah totally and radically driving in space <laughs> totally and radically driving in space <laughs> well and i love that like osgood doesn't know like what it stands for <laughs> like she's right. such a fan of the doctor but that's like that's like the one thing she doesn't know yet <laughs> she's like i never caught that <laughs> she was yeah. still studying she was learning that's right um well uh final thoughts um for me, uh, I, I think this episode was simply fantastic. Like it was really good. Mm-hmm. 
it was like finally a second part or better than the first. I will agree with you on that. Finally, uh, out of all the second parters this whole season, this one was the was the only one that I felt was actually better than the first. Uh, I love the back and forth between Bonnie and Clara. So, I mean, kudos to Jenna Coleman. Like we said earlier, she was just fantastic in making me see two different characters. Um, and and then the back and forth between the Doctor and Osgood was good. Those scenes, you know, like right after the plane crash and everything. I liked all that. Uh, and besides the dropping of the those, like kind of those plot points that I talked about, I, I, this episode was worth it for the speech alone. Uh, this was definitely... Capaldi's defining Doctor moment. It's going to be one of those where people will be talking about it for a really long time. Um, I mean, they're still talking about it. I mean, it's, it's. I know it's only. It hasn't been that long, but it's. People are still talking about that as if it's going to be something that's just going to stand the test of time. Yeah. It's going to be around for long. To me, this is like his. You know, his Waters of Mars. Like David Tennant's Waters of Mars was such a. a you know, crazy episode and really intense. Uh, you know, his Pandorica speech, like Matt Smith's Pandorica speech. Yeah. And, you know, even his, like, Genesis of the Daleks, like, for the fourth Doctor, how that was, like, one of the biggest ones for him. I feel like this speech is going is what, when we look back at the, when we're on, you know, Doctor number 18, or whatever, and we right. look <laughs> we look back at, se- at the twelfth Doctor, this is, like, what we're going to... This will be a lot of the, like, you know, if it's like a clip show or something, this will be the clip. For sure. Right. Um, so I definitely had some of the feels after watching this episode. It was, it was great. Uh, yeah, I, it was. It was definitely another decent episode. Uh, better than the second part for each story uh, that's aired so far this season. Uh, it was a good resolution from a story that started from the fiftieth and went all the way through the Zygon invasion. Uh, this is how a strong Doctor Who can be written. Uh, when it's written well. Now, I'm, I'm still not sold on this season. And this episode is another one of those, oh, but you'll love us this time around, kind of hard sell. It's it's trying so hard to get me to like it, and it's just it's just not coming off, you know, the way I think they want it to. Seeing Osgood again was great, but I think we all kind of feel that the, the real Osgood died on board that plane, that we were so shocked by that, that any any version of Osgood that we could have wanted to have with the Doctor really died then. Uh, no matter what they say, it won't be able to convince us that this Osgood is human. Uh, because we don't, we want to imagine that the, the real Osgood, you know, was Osgood, and that this is this is just a, an imposter with now two imposters. Um... <laughs> I don't know. They, they go out of their way, really, to make us feel like there's no longer a human Osgood at all. They really don't want that question answered. And you would imagine if she was human, she'd tell the doctor. Mm-hmm. You'd imagine when he asked her that many times, she would have been honest about it. Uh, look, Capaldi certainly shines in his speech. It's maybe the only defining moment of his doctor. Uh, it, it would have had more of an impact, I think, if every fan site on Facebook had spoiled it. <laughs> with their headlines. <laughs> Best episode yet, and that one speech, brilliant! Or, uh, nothing beats Capaldi after that scene and that speech. I and mean, they were just two, that's just two of the aggravating headlines that showed up only minutes after the show aired in England. Now, can we please, please, get a 48 hour embargo on things like that? Honestly, I think it's all Moffat's fault. Thanks, <laughs> Moffat. Thanks. Thanks, Moffat. Way to go. Thanks. Jerk. <laughs> so it was decent. It wasn't bad. Um, I did. It, I, I disagree. It was not better than the, the first part. Uh, and I, I don't think. I don't. I, it was almost as good, I guess. But again, all the first parts have been action and suspense and excitement, and all the second parts have been the drama and slowed it down. And in the case of uh, Maisie Williams, that ruined it. And in this case, that left it about as good as the first one so we'll see we'll see uh, the, the next two parter that we're going to see is going to be um, the finale so we got two single single made episodes and then a two parter to end to end the series one two parter to rule them all 
One two parter <laughs> to find them. One two parter in the darkness and bind them. And by Capaldi, bind them. <laughs> by Capaldi, bind them. Calculating. Voices from the Vortex gives the Zygon inversion. Seven out of ten. Well, speaking of those single episodes... Oh my god, that that promo. promo. Oh my god, that promo. Yeah, it was was an okay promo. (laughs) Oh my god. I wasn't even even that excited by the promo. Like... Oh my god, the promo? (laughs) Oh, and, and all right, yeah, promo. <laughs> <laughs> little different, little different feeling on this one. Most yeah, of the promos, the, the promos, God, Capaldi's promos are just terrible. Two seasons worth of just bad trailers. Yeah, I'm not excited when I watch his trailers. Just not. Yeah, so, I, I don't can't, know. It, I it can't... looks kind of cool. The I... mm. yeah. Well, I was just say trailers are no <sighs> trailers are. They're only exciting for like the the minute after I see them, and then the, and then they're instantly inf- forgettable. <laughs> so it's like I just forget about the trailers. No, uh, but some some of these promos uh, for Doctor Who have been absolutely phenomenal. The promo for uh, Journey's End was, I think, one of the best trailers for the next episode Doctor Who's ever done. And it's it's just it's just Davros. It's just Davros doing his speech as you see images of craziness happening, and most of it from that episode that you just watched. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I some of the promos in Tenet's era and, and a lot of them in Smith's era were just just amazing. Almost as exciting to watch that as it was to then watch the episode. Almost. <laughs> but not Capaldi. Capaldi right. apparently doesn't get good trailers. Yeah, well. Well, yeah. sleep sleep no more. Uh, so yep. w- what I got from this is there's some sort of space station and there's a scientist who's developed something that allows the people not to have to sleep. So it gives them sort of that the feeling that they've slept for eight hours, but they, they haven't. Um, this trailer didn't give, really give us any monster clues like of like what the monster is. Like there was kind of like some growling or something. But like, there's Probably no. Probably someone wasn't slept in a month. Yeah, somebody. Yeah, and they're real grouchy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a real monster before I've had my coffee. Um... Uh... <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean that was that's kind of what we got out of that. And then, I guess I was confused. Wasn't there supposed to be an episode where it was just Capaldi, and it was? I thought this was going to be the one. Well, no, that it, that's it's part it's part one of two for the season finale. Okay, okay, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, I was under the impression that this was the one, so I was I, no that the found footage episode because this is the this is yeah this is Mark Gatiss's found footage episode that we've been hearing about. That's that uh, it looks cool. Like I think it looks pretty neat. I will agree the promo is kind of lame, but I think this episode really looks pretty neat, especially with the found footage stuff. Um, but I, I thought the found footage one was the Capaldi only. But this, to have Clara in there would be good, too. I don't know if I'm ready to yeah to, to have, I don't say know. Say goodbye. Say goodbye. <laughs> it's so hard to say goodbye. <laughs> well, guys, thanks for tuning in again for another week. Um, we will see you here next week as we review the found footage episode. Mm-hmm. So... Until then, sleep plenty. Not no more. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Have sweet dreams because sleep no more. Sleeping no more is coming. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. So get a dream crab, stick it on your face. (laughs) Go to bed. (laughs) All right. All right. See you guys later. Bye, everybody. Bye. This has been another Voices from the Vortex review, Series 9, starring Matthew Whitecamp as Matt the Time Lord, Taylor Davidson as Taylor the Time Lord, and Daniel Davidson as the TARDIS. 
All views expressed are the opinions of the two dudes from Gallifrey, and as such should be taken extremely seriously. Follow Voices from the Vortex on all social media, including Facebook, Tumblr, and Twitter. If you have any questions regarding the podcast, please email us at voicesfromthevortex at gmail.com. Doctor Who and all related material is copyright BBC. No infringement of copyright is intended. All originally written material is fan fiction of a satirical nature. Please, Mr. Moffat, don't sue. See you next time in the Vortex. Temporal flight engaged. Returning to the Vortex. End of transmission.